Meanwhile, on the comic box, Spoon! Oh no, what was actually the theme song? Dump twee, bop 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 twee dow. Chicka da dump dump dump, bee bop 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 twee dow. Dip it da bop bip bow, dop dop bip bow, dop dop dip down, dop dip down. Dump 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 dip dump dip ba. See, that was the theme from The Tick, which is our topic. Hi, everyone! Welcome to issue 66 of the Comic Box, part of the geek to geek Podcast Network. I am Rob, your friendly neighborhood comic geek, and I am running solo here at the beginning because what we are doing today is catching the second half of the interview, I guess, if we call it interview, that I did with uh, my buddy Fletch out in New York. Stand-up comedian, guy who worked on The Tick, all-around really nice guy. Uh, But first... The Weekly Geekery. It has been a week since uh, we started the recording there last week, obviously, because I said it was a week, and that makes sense, right? Excellent. I haven't done a ton of geeky stuff. I went to the Renaissance Festival, which was very cool. Uh, It was Pirate Weekend. I dressed in pirate garb. I went and did the costume contest. I won third place at the Pirate Costume Contest, so that was a lot of fun. And then, as my old math teacher, Mr. Schrankler, used to say, uh, had one too many Coca-Colas over the weekend. And uh, so I did not feel that well going into Monday when I didn't sleep all night the previous night before because I didn't feel well. And then that night I went to an Andrew W.K. concert. Hashtag party, 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 party. It was an awesome show. I had a really good time. Uh, And I actually walked out feeling better than when I walked in. I was feeling very groggy and my stomach still wasn't really happy with me when I went to the show. So that was fun. As far as television goes, I stopped watching uh, Vikings simply because I realized that the new season of The Walking Dead is now on Netflix. So I went ahead and watched the first episode again, which I had seen previously of this past season, the one where Negan gets... Uh, baddie, I guess, is the best way to put that. And then, what else did we do? Oh, we went back and watched A Fish Called Wanda, The Wife and I, since Fletch was talking about it on last week's episode. So, obviously, that was a thing that needed to be done, so we went back and watched A Fish Called Wanda, and it's still an enjoyable movie, still kind of a weird movie, but I absolutely see why Fletch likes it, because it very much fits his sense of humor, I guess. Beyond that, as far as comics, I really haven't done a whole lot this week. I just haven't had the chance. I'm still reading through volume two of Monstrous. I feel like I'm getting close to the end. And I just, I still have to say how amazing that art is and how much Void needs to read that comic book. I also read it not just in bed. So I also uh, read it where I had the blue shift on and there is much more color in it that way. It's not as brown tones, obviously, since there's blue in there. But in general, it's still kind of muted color, but just gorgeous all around. The color work is great. The pencil work is great. And the story is fairly interesting. I also finished rereading Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and I started watching my least favorite Harry Potter movie, the fourth one, Goblet of Fire, because I'm going to a Harry Potter pub crawl this upcoming weekend, and I'm going to be dressed as Mad-Eye Moody again, so I'm kind of refreshing myself on my Moody lines and that sort of thing. I know I could totally just go to YouTube and look up Mad-Eye Moody clips or something, but I figured why not? I was walking on the treadmill, getting my steps in, and I figured I would do that. As far as news, there's plenty. There's a new Punisher trailer, there's news about an X-Force movie coming our way, and, like, a ton of X-Men stuff. But I'm not going to talk about it this week. I think if I can get a hold of Liam early next week, maybe we will talk about that next week. Otherwise, uh, next weekend, I am headed to Iowa to go work opening night at the haunted house I used to work at when I lived down there because I'm a nice guy, and it's, like, the one time a year I get to go down and see all my haunted house friends. So because of that... I don't know if Liam and I will get a chance to record. If that's the case, though, we totally won't miss anything here. I will just throw up one of the episodes from the convention where we did a panel. And so you guys will still get something cool to listen to. And I'll just have to figure out a way to put that together. So without further ado, 
Let's cut to a quick commercial break, and we will be right back. Hey everyone, I'm Katie. And I'm Chelsea, and we're the hosts of the podcast, Tea Time with Katie and Chelsea. We are two best friends who love pop culture. We try to have a female perspective on things, but we really just talk about anything we like. What are some recent topics we've done, Katie? Uh, Well, we've talked about girl power songs, Wonder Woman, Veronica Mars, young adult fiction novels, San Diego Comic Con, and so much more. So grab your cup of tea or whatever your drink of choice is and download our podcast on iTunes or Stitcher and start listening today. Hi, my name is Joe Hogan, and I'm a geek. And if you're currently listening to this, there's a good chance you're a geek too. So check out my podcast, Geektitude. Each week, I talk with somebody about their geek aptitude. Sometimes I talk to people in a geeky profession, Sometimes it's someone doing something really cool with their geekiness. Often it's another geeky podcaster. But it's always someone who wants to share their inner geek. So join me each week as we come together to geek out about all the geeky stuff we love. And remember, this week, keep it geek. And we are back. And now let's go into the second part of that conversation I had with Fletch. And um, I think we closed it out. And if not, I'm just going to go ahead and let it end or run into the final commercial or whatever I do. Yes, I know. It's a manual again. Ugh, I don't know. It's Fletch ruined everything for me. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> so at this point, I'm going to turn you guys over to me in the past along with Fletch. And I will see you guys next week. All right. So, uh, hi again, Fletch. Hey, Robierto. To everybody else, it was a week. To us, we literally kept recording. This is going to be such a pain to edit. We didn't even stop and record a separate file for this. No. Nope. That would be that would be smart, but whatever. We're going to do it anyway. All right. So, um, just diving straight into the topic of the week is um, the tick. Is you worked on the tick, and uh, someone had brought it up. I was I was throwing out on our Slack channel potential ideas. And uh, someone had brought up sort of how you take a property like a comic book and what kind of creative process it has to go through for it to get to the screen. And I know there's stuff that you probably don't have experience with, but the thought was if you were working on the show at all, that maybe you have a bit of an insight into how something like The Tick goes from page to screen. Sure. Okay. So go do it. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) Well, here, all right, I dropped that ball. Lob up another one for me. How is it working on the tick? Now, you're done with season one. Look at this. I'm just, yes. that's how easily I reset. Uh, season one is done shooting, and are you finished working on the show then as well? I have. They've okay. completely, they've wrapped principal photography on season one. Okay. And I believe at this point, the first six episodes are available on Amazon. And have you seen any of it? Yep, I've seen them all. They're half what, an hour half an hour long. Okay. And now what do you think coming to it having been on the inside? It's it's crisp, it's fun and it's wacky. I think it's I haven't really seen too much of uh the creators interviews with the creators, but I I would think that he's uh, quite pleased with how it turned out. It has a okay. massive everybody seems to know about it in New York. So I think that can only be good and great things. And the advertising that they did around the city was a lot of was a lot of fun. I was pretty amused by their approach to it. And hats off to Amazon because, in my recollection, I think this is kind of their first big outing. They've got uh, extremely wonderful programs such as uh, The Man in High Castle, Transparent. They did the Woody Allen Project. I know that I'm leaving out some fan favorites. I apologize. But I think in this case, The Tick is something that people have some kind of connection to. Either your kids watched it or your siblings uh, were diehard fans, or your aunts and uncles just completely ate it up when it first came out in the 80s, somehow you have some association to it, and therefore um, a draw. And I think that um, all creators and people involved, just um, they rode a very good wave and were able to get a great response. So kudos to everyone. Now, how familiar were you with the property before you went to work on it? I wasn't completely familiar with the um publication okay i had watched i had watched the animated show quite religiously Mm -hmm. Uh, i had seen maybe a couple of episodes of the patrick warburton series i think they only did nine episodes am i 
Do you I don't. got the math have, on that? But, I have no okay. idea. I, I I'm I'm feeling fairly confident that it only made up to nine episodes, and I know I've seen them. I don't know if I've seen it the full Monty of what they put out, but uh, going into the project, I was like, hmm, Putty Patrick Warburton was pretty 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 good to go full Larry David, and so I was curious to see what happens. And I have to say, uh, uh, one of my major opinions about the show is I think that. They did top notch casting with the tech. The this Amazon show, or you're talking about the yes, okay, yes, yes, okay. They 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 nailed it with him. He some of the lines that he delivers, and granted, if you've been associated or read anything with the tech, he has a very unique vocabulary. His cadences are just kind of out there, screwy. I mean, it's fun. It's fun to read, but then when you think that you actually have to project this audibly and make it work in whatever scenario you happen to be in peter just did a great job he he genuinely cracked me up and i i very much enjoyed it i think he did an awesome awesome job okay i still i still have to check it out i haven't yet but the main thing we wanted to talk about in relation to the tick then is taking the comic property and adapting it in these different formats so having seen a little bit of all of them is this one because i know this one has uh it's ben edlin correct yes the creator involved in this one certainly does one feel more authentic than the others? Is there and and if so, why? That is a wonderful question. Well, that's our topic um, this week. Yeah, no, <laughs> this is a good question. Who posed this question? Um, I would have to pull out and and look on Slack. I can do it while don't do that. You, don't do that. While you children attempt are probably to, listening. While you attempt to to answer. Uh, no, thinking about it, I think with this this interpretation, it's just a very very fresh take. And it's just so cool and crisp. They did a great job. Okay. Remind remind me again what was the question. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. And it also... uh... Sorry, I caught myself in the mirror and I got to tell you guys. I wish you. I might tweet what I I see right now. Okay. Well, so we have we have we'll both both Stephen C and Data Error, uh, in the Slack channel asking things. You know, I've always wondered. I'm reading this directly here. Uh, I've, oh great! I've always wondered how creators decide what and how certain details have to be modified or eliminating, eliminated when changing mediums. Gotcha. You know that's that's an interesting thing too because um, obviously when it came to the live action version, different properties and different productions were involved that affected what could be shown on the show. So you and I always talk about this. One of our favorite characters is uh, Deflator Mouse. Mm-hmm. For the live action version, he had to be changed because they did not have the rights to Deflator Mouse. Yeah, just because of the the opera. No, um, I think it's because of the animated series. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's correct if I'm if I'm remembering it. So they didn't have you know American made and um... no, the live action version. It was Captain Liberty and Batman. Well, that's weird, isn't it? See, and this is where we need to know more about the comics because it might be that in the comic books is Batman. Well. No, it's Deflator Mouse. It is Deflator Mouse in the comics? Yep. I know it's in the animated series. Yep. It's Deflator okay. Mouse in the comics. Okay. All right. Interesting. Well, I would I would say I would say, you know what, um you, and coming Oh, back... I'm sorry. Apparently what you <laughs> what you would say is more important than what I would say. <laughs> well, let's be honest. I mean, I wore a tie. Okay. What I think uh, the Amazon project a huge point that I didn't make and should stress is the showrunners and writers really took hold of the essentials of what people love about the tick and they didn't they didn't need to play i mean they had a solid hand they did not need to bet all the chips they laid down a just a a a nice nice plan of where they could possibly go but they have a solid foundation to build on from there. Okay. And I think that's one of the important things to try and look at is what do they decide is important and who makes that decision? Right. Because I remember things like, uh, and this is just me pulling random things off the top of my head here, but like I'm a big fan of the the late 90s, early 2000s show Freaky Links, right, that lasted barely a season uh, before getting pulled. Or it didn't even last the full season before getting pulled. And I have the original screenplay. And he originally, the character was supposed to be a, a, a skateboarder. He was supposed to ride a skateboard. 
But the executives at Fox said nobody rides skateboards. Nobody's going to ride skateboards. He should be a surfer instead. And this is literally right before the Tony Hawk explosion. And so if I feel like and not to paint all executives as as evil like Futurama did with their powdered executive, (laughs) but that idea of like they want to just see regurgitated versions of things that have already been proven as popular because that's going in their mind to get the more ratings. Hence CSI McDonald's and CIS Burger King. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and law and order Alabama unit. (laughs) <laughs> and I just say that because Beach is down in Alabama, and for some reason that's what popped in my head. But that's why, you know, you get all these clone shows, hence all of these, you know, comic book TV shows right now because that's what's what's proving popular. And I think that's probably the key to them being allowed to do it. A, because it's Amazon, and they might be willing to take some more chances because playing it safe is not going to get them to draw viewers from, say, network television. You know, nobody's going to come to them to pay for content if it's the exact same as the content they already get somewhere else. Right. And the viewers that come onto Amazon, they don't want to play it safe. Right. So I think that allows them to say it's okay for you to take some more stuff from the comics that might seem weird or out there. It's okay for you to be a little more weird. Because I feel like the executives from the network that aren't actually like executive producers of the show, just the network people will say, will air your show but you need to change A, B, C, and D, and it's usually your main character needs to be more attractive and younger and white. You need to uh, have something that will allow us to do product placement or something in there. You know, like how all the cars on The Walking Dead are, like, recently washed. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> and running perfectly. But as far as choosing what can stay and what has to go, obviously, in any... Okay, so I say this as a content creator, right? And this doesn't apply to this show because this show is totally a passion project where I kind of do whatever I want. But normally speaking, if I'm if I'm writing something for work, rule number one is always know your audience. Everything has to be geared toward, and you know this as a as a performer. It's mm-hmm. you kind of now I don't know if you just kind of do what you think is funny because maybe since your audience changes every night when you perform, or if it's who is my audience. I need to tailor it to them. But I would say in TV, there's that mix between assuming who your audience is and then making content that will suit them or creating content and hoping you generate a new audience around it. And I think when it comes to things on like network television, they kind of know who that audience is or feel they do. They don't want to push any buttons. So they're going to tailor their story and their casting and everything in order to suit who that audience is. Am I making sense? I feel like I'm saying two things at once. No, no, no. I dig it. I'm on board. Okay. So in that sense, it's that idea of, well, what are we allowed to do? Well, a lot of it's obviously going to be this material is inappropriate or this is going to go over their heads. I don't think you're going to see incredibly. So there's all the different adaptations of Sandman that keep getting kicked around, right? Yeah. And some of that is very heady stuff. It's very sort of complicated subject matter. I feel like that's probably going to get dumbed down. They're going to say, we're going to try and stay with the spirit of the material. But even Doctor Strange, look at how much they simplified magic in that. He can A, create stuff out of green lines, and B, use a sling ring, which was an original creation for the movie, use a magical tool to create portals. And that's pretty much it. Yep. He's not doing literally everything like he can do. And in the refilling comic books. beer jugs. Yes. And he can refill he can refill your, your beer glass. That was the first time I was like, ooh, that's actually magic. Yeah, exactly. Everything else is sort of this rooted in sort of not exactly science, but they give you a direct explanation. Yeah. So I think that's just for audiences that are unfamiliar, and I think you just have to choose very carefully how closely you want to stick to your source material. Like, is it okay for this to be a Batman with a Robin who's died and was killed by the Joker, and we don't know if there's another Robin or a Nightwing or anything out there? Right. You know? like. Well, I think one thing that we're kind of hinting at and alluding to, especially with media today in our, our films and our TV shows, is that it is so much more an incredibly relationship base. So not only do you have to your your huge rule that you've drove home time and time and again and I do believe in it is to know your audience but now since it is a relationship based things are so happening you have 
interaction with your audiences, you need to know yourself as well. And how do you mean? Well, take in case for comic uh, comic book movies in general, you can't just uh, rewrite the story. You can't just say that, oh, Joker killed Batman's parents. Well, but they did, and that movie was still a massive success and led to this like resurgence of Batmania in the early 90s. Right. But, I mean, it's always hindered it. I'll give you that. As a comic fan, I, I agree with you, yeah. And fool me once but you can't get yeah. a, you can't get away with that again and it's catching well, it's catching up with people too take for um instance uh look at like suicide squad i don't know if rick flag and enchantress actually uh are an item in the comic hated that i yeah. think it was a disservice to both their characters i feel that same way about colleen wing and iron fist okay th- yeah there you go. In, in Iron and, Fist. And look at how Iron Fist turned out. Yeah, but that's I'm not going to blame the fact that there's a love story in it. But it is where some people are like, well, we need a love story. or, it, But see, in the case of the Joker and Batman's parents, I always kind of didn't like that as well because I it's the same as Sandman killing Sp- uh, Uncle Ben. Right. You know, yeah. but it's that idea of it takes a story and turns it into more of a single tale they're telling rather than being more expansive. Here's our bad guy. And we're going to give you an extra reason to dislike them beyond them just being Mm -hmm. a bad guy, because that's the difference between a movie and a comic, but we don't necessarily need that either. Take Hans Gruber, one of the great movie villains, right? And die hard. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't, kill Die Hard's parents. <laughs> I love that Bruce Willis. Hey, Die Hard. <laughs> His name's Die Hard. Sergeant Die Hard, get over here. <laughs> That's we, from something. And for gotta, the life of me, I was trying to remember- we got to talk it, about it, your it, paperwork. <laughs> yeah, it comes up every once in a while. And for the life of me, I can't remember. I swear I thought it was Friends, where they argue about the fact that his name isn't Die Hard, but I can't recall what show that was, where he's like, oh, this one where Die Hard does this, and that one where Die Hard takes out the helicopter. Like, his name isn't Die Hard. That's a- I don't know. I don't know what that's from. But yeah, it's that idea of we don't need you to give us necessarily that complete package. It's okay to open it up a little bit. But that, I, think I think that's what I'm trying to um, boil down and hint to, is that yeah. um, in terms of knowing yourself, is have the confidence you okay, don't. But you don't, you don't need time, to give me. You don't need to give me another half hour of the origin story. You can have the confidence to tell the story that you originally want to set out to do, and respect your audience, know your audience. That yeah, they know it. They've done it. We have mutual respect going. That we can tell the story that we want to tell without adding in stuff for people that may be a little bit late to the party. Just trust that your guacamole is good. Right, but keep in mind, unlike maybe, and I say this not really knowing, if the Tick TV show is they're telling sort of new stories with this character, which serves the Tick well because I feel like the Tick very much was a lot of one-and-done stories and just sort of random tales that take place in this universe rather than much of a a long ongoing saga. But a lot of the Marvel movies and things, they're taking direct storylines or versions of storylines, but it's things like Tony Stark and Bruce Banner creating Ultron. Ultron in the comic books is created by Hank Pym. So at what point is it okay to divert and do something? Because I feel like Tony Stark creating Ultron is the same as the Joker killing Batman's parents. It, by definition, changes the origin of a character, hence part of the purpose of that character, maybe, you know. But does it serve its own narrative as a film better? Or was it like, well, then just frickin' put Hank Pym in your movie and stop screwing around? You know, what's the better option there? That, that's, wow, that, I wasn't expecting that one to come out, and I think I'd have to agree with the latter. Is you would rather just see a direct book-to-film adaptation, like a, you know, Romeo and Juliet uh, brought on thing, it's the stage play just filmed on camera? I, yeah, um, I don't know if direct or anything, but I don't want the easy cop-out. Okay. Now, thinking about that in hindsight now, it does seem like, oh yeah, just make, um, Robert Robert Downey Jr., the creator of Ultron, that, that makes things pretty easy in terms of casting, production, everything. Yeah. Plus, you were the one that said you wanted simpler plots. I'm I'm assume, I'm thinking off the top of my head, I believe that was what we're going to yeah. call last week, but sort of the first half of this conversation we've been having over the last couple hours here mm-hmm. is you want a more simple plot. And the problem is when you get into comics continuity, nothing is simple. No. It is not. Um, You know, you even start talking about Batman's origin and Joe Chill, and sometimes he knows it's Joe Chill. Sometimes in other versions he doesn't. It's just a random hood. Like, and how do you want to, 
approach some of those things. So if you're taking a comic book and adapting it, where do you decide to start making cuts? Good question. Is it we need a simpler plot with a smaller cast so that it's easier to handle on a television show? Do you take, uh, and I think one of the issues that a lot of different comic book movies have always had problems with, and cartoons, do you reference things just for an Easter egg to tease a larger universe out there, or do you have to keep it insular because you just want to tell your story? I love that question, and I had to put an ice cube down my shirt. Um, <laughs> it that no, that's fascinating. I love I love that you brought that up, and as you were going along there, I couldn't help but think of. A ba- I'm, yeah, you love this right now. I know you do, but it was a cold ice cube. What can I say? Um, I was thinking of Batman and yeah. in particular Hush. Hush is okay. um, a pretty fa- um, fantastical story. Amazingly, it involves all of Batman's characters, all, all, all of the villains, everybody into that. But in terms of um, in story and how I said, yeah, I like my stories a little bit simpler in plot. What really drew me into Hush is that... Um, the story does relish and revolves around details. Yes, like any good detective story does. Yes, but much more, um, this one knew how to play them perfectly. And I, I think of like, uh, oh, what is such a random detail is when towards the end of the story, you find out that um, the Bat computer had been reprogrammed to throw in Hush's image. And I don't want to reveal too many spoilers, so I'm not going to say like names and everything, but... Hush's image somehow happens to get in the back computer to where it became a uh, um, a visual memory for Batman. It was like what what an incredibly detailed plot point, but it works so well in this story. But yet, it's not a story I think that's completely jam packed with Easter eggs and and major major sidetracks. Right. But now, could you adapt Hush properly for? the screen in a single film in a single not in a single film no y- you know what i mean yeah no you can do that so it's but what if they wanted to tell that because you know all the, i don't think the, audiences the, are there yet no but i think the stories that they keep pulling for these movies they're trying to pull these big popular well-respected comic book stories mm-hmm. but the, they're all massive with all it's the problem with comic book crossover events i think that's too. yeah is they get too complicated in themselves with too many ins and outs and side plots and spin-offs and and tie-in issues. Uh, so then when they try and, and move them over to another medium, they're far, far too complicated. So in that sense, you know, because you have like Void who talks about how he hates superhero origin stories. It's like just tell us through the rest of the story what happened. I don't care. I don't need to see another person design their costume for the first time. But the reason they keep going to those is they're the simplest stories to tell and the easiest for an audience to relate to that might be unfamiliar. Because the other problem is they're making comic book movies for not necessarily comic book audiences or even the ones that they do. You have something like Guardians of the Galaxy where they're very much going to water it down until it's something like the the comic, while it has the similar characters that they used in the movie completely completely different the original guardians of the gal well not the original the team the movie is based off of got together after an intergalactic war Mm -hmm. because there were tears in time and space that needed repairing and star lord has mantis the the character from the second one that can sort of read minds um she's far more powerful in the comic books he has her subtly control the minds of the guardians because none of them would work together otherwise to create a team that can still try and keep the peace after this massive intergalactic war. So it's a totally different story than what we get. It has nothing to do with Infinity Gems uh, or anything like that. So that's an example of an adaptation that people absolutely love Mm -hmm. that has very little to do with the comics, but I'm okay with it, and maybe it's because the comics aren't as well established. You know, people want a Superman movie that embodies hope and is hopeful because that's our interpretation of the character, mostly based on previous movies, more so, I think, than some of the comics. Though there are comic books, obviously, like All-Star Superman that are beautiful and... Or whatever happened in Man of Tomorrow. Exactly, exactly. But people saying that's what Superman should be. You know, Spider-Man should not be emo and do dance numbers. And it's like, clearly you never read early Spider-Man stories. 
mm-hmm. where all he did was complain and sit in a corner and cry and then have weird, wacky adventures and do <laughs> weird stuff. I thought you were going to say weird, wacky adventures in the corner. I was like, well, I didn't read nope, that. Nope, not I, that far. I didn't read that <laughs> issue. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was in the grim and gritty '90s where things got very real very quickly. He was McFarling in. Um, yes, exactly. It was McFarlane with all those, you know, where he was. <laughs> Never mind. I was going to get into McFarlane's art and the way he he draws Spider-Man in weird positions and his legs being in all different angles. Anyway, um, yeah. So I mean, I think there's something to be said for taking those properties, you know, really depowering Doctor Strange or completely redoing the plot of how the Guardians of the Galaxy get together. What I don't like is then when it turns around and then gets reflected back into the comic books, I want the comics to keep going along what they're doing. To retain their identity, to to keep the confidence. Well, heck, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? Like, Shredder dies in the very first issue of the comic book, and it was gory and black and white, and the whole point was it was making fun of the grim and gritty stuff of the 90s, and that became this giant child-friendly mega huge cultural zeitgeist thing to sell pizza (laughs) yeah exactly and so i don't i don't know i don't know where it's i think you would have to take it property by property almost and then determine either if you have an intended audience or you're just translating it because otherwise i would say i want direct translations when it comes to animated stuff absolutely if you're assuming i know who these characters are in the universe they live in I want a more direct adaptation. Like with the the animated Batman Year One, I didn't like that I didn't get the internal monologue. Well, from who? Yeah, you did. From Batman. Yeah, you did. In the Year One animated? Didn't he? No. Oh, okay. Oh, it's just all Gordon. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Or or um, or maybe I'm thinking of the Dark Knight. Maybe I'm thinking of the Dark. I thought they didn't do it in Year One either. No, I feel like um, Ben McKenzie is doing the narration. In year okay. one, and I think you're right. I think it's Dark Knight. You don't really get um, Peter Weller doing well because to me, it's the scene that made that entire comic for me. Is the you know there are 36 working uh, responses from this position or or whatever it is where the guy pulls the gun on him because that to me was the essence of what Frank Miller's old Batman was, and we don't get that because there was no inner monologue, and that really bothered me because I thought that was an element that should have been included. Yes. But uh, let's bring it kind of back a little bit as I keep I keep getting <laughs> off on weird tangents and we lose We're in connection. We're the Boundary and, Waters, folks. Yeah, exactly. Let's let's bring it back to, to I don't know, Duluth at the very least. Um, these are all Minnesota references. With The Tick, do you have any insight onto sort of how they handled pulling comic stuff in? I don't believe you were involved with the writers at all, but I, I don't know. No, I was golfing at the time. Well, naturally. Exactly. No, I don't. I know that there were a lot of concept meetings. So just that it took a lot of work and a lot of effort for them to make that decision. Yeah, there's a lot of good discussions. And I think it's just great that we live in a day and age where productions are taking such a huge consideration of like, no, no, let's instead of let's just go shoot it. Like, no, 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 no. We have to we have to think ahead of why. What what purpose is this serving to the story? That's, right. that's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome that we get artists that are taking such good care of those properties and characters. And again, kind of like we were talking a little last week, uh, and I think it was last week and not this week, but the, specifically getting the creators involved. Right. So you have somebody who knows, as the writer, what the heart of the story is, and from that point, what it's okay to keep, what it's okay to get rid of. Exactly. You know, I mean, we could even start talking Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings books versus the movies and all the differences there and some of the crazy differences they were going to do that they didn't end up doing. But instead, I'd like to play a a game. I want to play a game. (laughs) Okay. But I just want to let me put this to you. It's not really a game. It's just more of uh, two questions for you. The first is, what is a comic book property that you would want to see brought to, and let's say live action, television or film, as a direct adaptation? What do you think would translate perfectly with nothing changed? Because this is always, as comic fans, we complain all the time that they didn't translate it right, they didn't do it right. What's the thing that you think could actually make that jump with next to no changes? It's a good one. I think we mentioned it briefly as required reading on your last episode, Kingdom Come. I would love to see that. I don't, I think the way it was written and structured is that you know these characters already and now you're talking live action Kingdom Come. Yep. 
You don't think that's too many characters? Is it going to it's going to a movie? Sure. Yeah, give it the Well, it, whatever. It could be an HBO mini. Give it the DOS boot. Oh, if it's an HBO mini series? Absolutely. Okay. Cuz granted most of the characters are background characters there. Yeah, even if it got like um a 6 episode treatment. I think it'd be great. Okay. All right. And then second question then would be what is a property that you would love to see on film or television, I guess, but feel like it would have to be completely reworked what do you think is a story you could keep true to the spirit of while still changing a whole bunch of of things about it Hmm. because that's the really tough one because that's what we see a lot of especially with like the marvel universe there's so much they do differently in weird movies that are completely off from the comics but work in the their established universe so is there something else that could be pulled and be like think captain marvel like i worked Captain Marvel, the female version, started as Miss Marvel, who got her powers because the previous Marvel was fighting somebody with a psychonomatron machine that exploded and infected her with Cree blood and some of Captain Marvel's powers or something. Like, I seriously don't think we're getting that origin. We're going to be getting something completely different for her character. Um, and I think people are going to be okay with that because I don't think her origin and those things are what's important about the character. Like with Dr. Strange, I don't think necessarily the specifics of his powers for him is what makes him important or a good character. It's trippy things, you know, Mm -hmm. and the idea of magic. So is there a character like that for you or a story like that for you that you could see pulled in, even if you had to lose a bunch of it from the comics? Maybe possibly Wildcats. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, did you watch the cartoon? Um, I don't know if we're thinking of. I don't know if they did a cartoon. They, I believe they did. Yeah, we're thinking of like Spart- Spartan, Spartan, Grifter, and Grifter, and Ma- yep, Mister Majestic. Um, yeah, maybe I vaguely remember. Yeah, yeah, I do. I think it was maybe on CBS or something like that. Yeah, it's very short lived, if I recall right. Yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah, but SWAT cats, SWAT, SWAT cats, cats was, took over. Yeah, SWAT cats <laughs> took over. <laughs> Um, I think Wildcats would definitely be up there. And then uh, just to um, toot your own horn, Moon Knight. Oh, yeah. There's no way. Like, if you do Moon Knight, I honestly think you could start from the beginning, though. I think you could do an, a, a faithful adaptation of early Moon Knight stories where he was dealing with not exactly. Now, OK, you're going to pull me off on this crazy tangent, though, because Moon Knight's introduction <laughs> the waters was are as warm. A, Come on over. Right. <laughs> Because Moon Knight started out as a character who was a bad guy in Werewolf by Night as an employee of this company who had all of these silver weapons to take out the wolf. Like, that's why he was a moon-themed character. He was a bad guy, but he just proved popular with readers, so they spun him into his own story, completely retconned it, and then eventually gave us the backstory of Mark Spector. But I think you could do that. Uh, People have talked about it being a great idea for a Netflix show. But I think you could do the actual, if we go with what we'll say, the canon origin story of uh, Moon Knight as being a mercenary who is shot and bleeds out in front of this statue of a moon god in Egypt and then kind of snaps and goes crazy and gains multiple secret identities and maybe has extra strength during the moon, but maybe not. And really the idea of this guy is insane, which I think came about more later. But yes. I think uh, I think Moon Knight would be a good call, but again, but I I think they could actually be fairly true to the comics. Okay, I'm going to do them now. Yes, but I don't. I didn't actually think when I asked the the question. I didn't think of of what my answer would be there. Um, honestly, okay. Let me start with this. If you were going to slim it down, I think what would be fun, especially probably as like a cartoon or even just a couple episode arc of a cartoon is you could do Infinity War, but the comic version of Infinity War that followed Infinity Gauntlet and um, had people fighting like evil doppelgangers of themselves because it was that simple of a conceit, pretty much. You know, you would have to change it up and do that. But one that I think would be a good direct adaptation that you could pull straight from the comics, that is so tough because I don't know that there's really a comic book out there that works is an insular enough story you know what? Um, Punisher Max, the Garth Ennis Punisher run, if you pulled that and made that into, say, an, a Netflix, or honestly, it would have to be like an HBO show because you would really have to be able to do the nudity and the cursing and the violence. 
I feel like that would work. I don't know if it would be a great show. I feel like it would be too much violence because in the comic it really is. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's kind of the point. Otherwise, geez, for a live action, something that could be... Because the other problem is things look goofy when you pull them out of the comics. Yeah. So, like, as fun as a Nightwing thing would be, like, I don't know that you're going to find an acrobatic enough actor that can pull all of that off, or even the stuntmen that are as good of an acrobat as he is in a fictional comic book universe, you're going to end up doing some sort of weird CG stuff, like the the live-action Titan show, which they have started casting. I expect that to be awful. I just I don't see it as a thing that they're going to be able to pull off. Yeah, boy, that is so tough. Because there's stories I would love to see, like uh, the JLA Rock of Ages storyline... I would like, you know, the Hell Jordan as as the Spectre was always a great run. Uh, Slingers, which is the short lived, which it would have to come off of another Spider-Man story because Slingers was a 12 issue run uh, when Spider-Man did the identity crisis thing where he wears different costumes and pretends to be different new superheroes. Mm-hmm. And then each of those costumes are given uh, through a deal with Mephisto spoilers are given to these young heroes and they take on all of these personas that spider-man threw away and it's this wonderful little 12 issue storyline boy that is such a difficult question that i posed for myself (laughs) i'm i'm I'm, well i'm rack i read so many comic books i'm racking my brain to think back and try and figure out i feel like you would probably have to turn to some of the indie comics then i honestly don't know if there's a good marvel or dc story that could be directly translated and be perfectly fine Hawkeye. How about the Matt Fracton Hawkeye run where it's him in a T-shirt and uh, he has the female Hawkeye with him and the pizza dog. Maybe not the pizza dog issues because those are done more like a family circus thing where it shows his trail as he sniffs around and finds things. But I think you could do that. Heck, I'll give you this. I think you could do the Matt Fracton Hawkeye run almost as a network television show. I agree with that. Maybe not super, because it's almost episodic in its nature, is it not? Yeah, I completely agree. And I think you would be able to physically do it as well uh, without a ton of extra special effects budget. And I think it's got the breaks and the the levity to be able to do that. Exactly. Because there's books and comics I've read where I'm like, man, this is great. And the panels are laid out like a good movie uh, uh storyboarding would be yeah i just don't know if marvel and dc necessarily have those stories i just keep thinking of the different else worlds or some of the indie comics like rachel rising that would do well or um some of the comics i suggested last week like uh like giant days obviously would work just because it's not crazy even i mean hell scott pilgrim they did a pretty good job of almost directly adapting that comic book yeah well played on that one I think there's arguments to be made for if you're willing to be outlandish, but if you're trying to tell a more serious story, uh, I kind of think the way they're adapting is sort of the way they have to go. They need to cut side stories. They need to cut characters. And we might hate them for it because we love the original stories and we want to see a direct adaptation. And I think the big one is just we have to make peace with the fact that they have to make these choices. I think we just end up disagreeing with the choices in particular that they make. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, everybody, everybody's just, we live in a day and age too, where everybody just wants the whole, whole pie, the whole cake. And you're not even realizing or acknowledging the fact that at least you're getting the dessert in general. We got a Doctor Strange movie. How crazy is that? An Iron Fist television show, as awful as it was, kind of still incredible that it happened. (laughs) Well, hell, the fact that they called the team the Defenders when they have nothing to do with the original Defenders. The original Defenders was like Ghost Rider, Doctor Strange, and the Silver Surfer, and the Hulk, I think. I might be confusing some of the different Defenders teams, but they had a rotating cast. But very different, you know? Mm -hmm. I'd love to see some Silver Surfer on the big screen, like a true good some Silver Surfer stuff. And I know everyone will disagree on what are the good or bad runs. The current run, I think, is phenomenal, but I believe it either just came to an end or it has one issue left. Uh, And it's very almost Doctor Who, and I say that not ever having watched Doctor Who. But it's every issue is a a one-off story. Even though there's a longer sort of tale, there's continuity being built. But every story has a beginning, middle, and an end. Everyone is its own adventure. And uh, it's all them going to weird different worlds and helping them solve problems. 
And I think that's fine. If anybody deserves that, I think Silver Surfer does too. And I think the term space opera gets thrown around so much and it never yeah. gets, I don't think it really ever gets fully realized. And that's a property where I think if you're going to own that terminology, that's the one that could do it. Oh, yeah. And I mean, and if it's for my money, there's stories I would love. Like there was a, a mini series called Cosmic Powers that took place as sort of an offshoot of a, of a larger story in um, Silver Surfer where there was a villain named Terax, who was a creation, I think, of Galactus, who is almost as powerful as Galactus. And he captures all of his previous heralds, so Terax and Morg and the Silver Surfer, and then he captures, like, Better Ray Bill, and he's siphoning off energy in order to have this giant showdown, I think, with Galactus. Uh, and that's in the Silver Surfer run. And then uh, you have this side story where Thanos just hears rumors of this person and decides he just wants to test his mettle against this character named Tyrant. And he starts collecting a band of people to fight with him and I don't know why, but I just absolutely loved those comics as a kid. And I never got to finish the story until like a year ago where I finally went and found the rest of the back issues. And as soon as I freaking did, then online popped up a trade paperback of that story. I was so mad. It took me Joy! years to find those those back issues. But yeah, it's so tough for me. I have so many little runs and all of my favorite comics were always canceled. And so I have these shorter runs or even longer runs of certain comics that I really enjoyed, but I think about what it would look like in live action and I just have to balk at it, you know? Mm -hmm. I almost think if you're doing a live action superhero thing, the tick is perfect. Like give us the sillier stuff because when you try to make something like powerless, you're going to fail because you're working off of source material that's not meant to be funny. Right. I don't know. The question you know what? Give me the question. I bet most of those stories you could do as direct adaptations. Even even if you dig into the Denny O'Neill stuff where it's all about him meditating and trying not to give in to his urge to beat up everybody because he's super violent and has issues. <laughs> Did you ever read any of that stuff? You gave me a couple okay. stories to check out in college. Okay. Yeah, it was weird stuff. It was weird stuff. So I don't know how long we're recording now because we're recording all of this in two clumps, but I'm looking at our thing and we're over... We're coming up on two hours and 20 minutes with all the starting and stopping between both episodes we've just recorded. So I'm going to say... I pissed into two jars. Yeah, I thank you. I'm going to say, is that an SNL reference? I don't know. In in Tina Fey's book, she talks about the SNL writers when they didn't want to leave would actually pee in <laughs> jars so they could keep working. Oh. Anyway, any final thoughts, I guess? on We didn't really get anywhere. We, we sort of pitched around ideas, and I think we came to the conclusion that it depends... And so long as you're careful, we're okay with it. Much like I think that's a much like many things in the world. <laughs> just be gentle. Just I think I think if anything, too, just keep an eye on North Korea. Yeah. Oh man. Well, yeah, because we're recording this late. I hope we're still here. I, as do I. But we recorded these episodes back to back on the 14th, which is when yet another North Korean missile went over Japan. Ah, it's just scary. So, a bit. Yeah, you, a bit. you know what? I'm going to I'm going to bring this back. I don't think we could do it. But there's and I want well, maybe I should save this for another episode on its own topic. I know I gave this to I must have given this to you to read in college. JLA Superpower? Yes. Where written well before, well it was written back when I was still in high school, I think. Uh so well before Saddam Hussein was taken down and and out of power was this story, a uh, Justice League story, of a new guy who joins the Justice League, but he wants to be more proactive about world issues. And they're trying to say, we need to let the world figure them out for themselves. We're here to, I mean, I, what is it? We're here to catch them if they fall. I don't remember what that's from, but that idea of we're not here to solve them, their problems for them. We're here when they absolutely have nowhere else to turn and to give them something to aspire to. But he's like, no, screw that. And he goes and ends up killing this Saddam Hussein-esque dictator in the Middle East, after which the whole region falls into civil war and millions more die because this person thought he was doing a good thing without really thinking it through. And again, this was pre-9-11 that this comic book came out. And then we hit that time, and then Iraq is dealing with the civil war after Saddam Hussein is taken out. And it wasn't a it's good for him to be in power. It was just the Justice League saying, we don't have the solution. We have the firepower, but we 
are not necessarily to be trusted with it or, or sort of that idea. And man, I would love a story like that to be told somewhere because it was such a good story that became so scarily prophetic. Do you think Marvel could do it? I think they're trying to do something like it with Tony Stark doing technology for technology's sake mm-hmm. and how he's saying his, which, but I mean, there's that whole argument of how he's kind of being just stupid in Civil War. Uh, I actually talked about the wife with that, where we talk Team Cap versus Team Iron Man after seeing the movie. And she's like, he says everything he does is rational, but then the one decision he makes is based on emotion after he gets chewed out by the mom of, we're not doing enough, aliens are coming, I'm going to create a giant robot army, and then like, oh wait, the robots are evil, how did I not see this coming? We need to be kept in check, everybody. When it's like, or just you, literally just you, Tony Stark. Like, <laughs> everybody else is doing fine. But I feel like they could broach that subject. Just uh, Justice League Unlimited did it. In the cartoon, they talked about how they have the giant space laser and uh, Green Arrow goes off on everybody about how he wants the government to have a deterrent to take out the Justice League because they shouldn't be trusted. Because who are they? But people who decided they were above the law because they were exceptional. So I love that kind of stuff in comics because while, yes, it's comics and I want to see bright colors and capes and people punching each other for no reason, I also kind of like where they dig in every once in a while and get philosophical about it. Well, yeah, it's just awesome to see different ideas, too. Yeah, there's room for both. From from the characters to actually ha- give them – I mean, you're not just enjoying their appearance. You are buying into their personalities. Yeah. <laughs> So, but let's say, final. I guess we already said final thoughts, and then we got off on another tangent, didn't we? Correction, you said that. I'm sorry. So you, do you <laughs> But I believe you gave your final thoughts, more or less. Yeah, I think I spit enough words. Okay. Well, uh, I look forward to watching The Tick. Let's make that the, um, I suppose that should have been the poll list for this week if we were talking about The Tick, but not really. We didn't really dig into The Tick very hard. So we'll say, for next week, read The Tick. Um, and read, uh, I guess, I don't know. What do you want? What do you want to say? Batman hush? Or was there something there that you thought, you know what? How about movie adaptations? This is a whole other topic. Movie comic book adaptations of movies. I have some of them. Like I have the Punisher comic book adaptation from the Dolph Lundgren movie. (laughs) And I have comic book adaptations of the underworld movies where they literally pack the whole movie into like a single issue. And it makes perfect sense that way. Well, I think they did. Oh, you know what? I didn't even, oh, we didn't even touch on aliens or predator. Now that could be some adaptations because, oh man, you just, you, I guess we're going another two hours. No, no, we'll save it for another time. (laughs) No, I was going to say, if you're going to read The Tick, yes, read The Tick, and then check it out. Yeah, absolutely. Watch I'll, I'll, watch a few episodes. I'll try and make time to at least watch the, the first uh, episode or two in the near Very future, cool. we'll say. I have no idea what the future holds here for me, scheduling-wise. Once we start getting into uh, October-ish, or near the end of the, the month, my weekends start getting full of uh, costumey things, which I'm looking forward to. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we're going to move into the end of the show then with a ba da bop do da ba da da bop ba da bop do fa. Fletch, I want to thank you so much for joining me for two episodes in a row, which is really one long episode full of us screwing up and the connection dropping out. It's been a, pl- um, yeah, it's been okay. It 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 has been. <laughs> it has been. Thank you. No higher no, it's praise. Been a great time can be expected of a man. True that. Of a man like it's yourself. been an honor. And a privilege. Yes. Uh, this show, geek to geek Podcast Network. So, geek to geekcastcom On Facebook, geek to geekcast On Reddit, our subreddit is geek to geekcast We have a Slack channel. Uh, link in the show notes for that, I guess. You can come and join a giant group chat with everybody. Uh, you can find this show at on Twitter at ComicBoxCast or email us at thecomicboxpodcast at gmail.com. I am on Twitter as at Nobi. Also, all of the link things in the show notes. Fletch, where can we find you? Hey, you can ha- uh, catch me hanging out with Rob on Twitter as well. I'm over there at, at the Kyle Fletcher. I'm also over at uh, Instagram at uh, Fletchergrams, doing my bizarre weird take on B-movie posters. Yeah, I do enjoy those, yeah. Thank you. And then uh, if you happen to be in New York, uh, come on by. Hopefully, I will be tweeting out more performances coming up. 
Uh, I'm aiming to get back down to the stand and Gotham Comedy Club in New York, Manhattan. And also trying to make my way... Actually, Broadway Comedy Club is in Manhattan, too. You know, I'm going to be all over Manhattan. Just tweet tweet at me where you're at, and I'll give you some digits. (laughs) Perfect. Hmm. Well, that is it for this week, then. Thanks, everybody, for joining us and for being kind, hopefully, through all the weird connection issues we've had for two straight weeks, which for us is one awful night. (laughs) (laughs) Just awful, awful night. And probably the longest editing job I have ever had to do on this show. So I'm going to thank me. Thank you, Rob, for sitting down and spending what I can only assume is 12 hours editing two (laughs) hour-long episodes together. Uh, But we are closing the comic box, and we will see you guys next week. I know you said you didn't want to, but can I still say kick it, Fletch? You can say kick it, Fletch. Well, kick it. Well, yeah, but you have to do the thing. Oh, that's right. Go for it. All right, I'm ready. So kick it, Fletch. Miller Boyette production. <laughs> A production of FNR Public Radio? Exactly. Used to be. That was the pipe dream. We almost had our own uh, podcast, you and I do. Well, I suppose it could happen someday still. Yeah, there's, I mean, so verbally, there's time. verbally, we copyright it now, FNR Public Radio. This is right. Okay. All right. We'll see you guys next week. See you all. I'm Void. And I'm Beach. And together, we're the geek to geek podcast. Well, we make it. It is kind of us, but I guess it's separate. Every week, we pick a topic from geek or digital culture and chat about it for a while. And you're invited. We talk about books and movies, games, comics, the internet. Or really whatever we feel like. Yeah, that too. So look for the geek to geek podcast on iTunes. Or wherever your podcasts are sold. Or downloaded. Or whatever. <laughs>